Chapter 15 Plant, Animal, and Human Nutrition and a Proposed Fertilizer Program The nutritional needs of human bodies are only partly dependent on the food we eat. Heredity probably plays a major role in how well we can get along on the food available to us. We know that people vary in their allergies. A given food may be good for some people and not for others. If we check on the nutritional needs of people like the Eskimo, who lives on fish and blubber, and then read a treatise on what a well-known nutritionist tells us we should eat to be healthy, we begin to wonder whether our thinking is as sound as it might be. The Eskimo lives in a cold climate. The man in the tropics lives under high temperatures where energy values are less important. And then we have all intermediate areas. We find variations among people. We have the thins, the fats, the talls, and the shorts. All probably require vitamins and minerals in widely different amounts. But regardless of what we do in the agricultural field, ultimately we get involved in human and animal nutrition. As a boy on the farm, I heard about easy keepers and hard keepers among horses. I have observed that we have people who fit into similar groups. Thus, if we assume that heredity controls sizes, shapes, and so on, we probably have to assume that for any one individual, we may have short fats, short leans, tall fats, and tall leans, all of whom have vitamin and mineral requirements. This seems to be true in the tropics as well as in the frigid zones, and the ease with which people build up body weight undoubtedly is the result of how many calories they take into their bodies. We know that when a person stops eating, he loses weight, while a glutton usually is heavy. But experimentally, we must learn by trial and error, since we have no two individuals possessing the same heredity. How well a person feels depends on how well his glands function, which also involves heredity and the minerals and vitamins he consumes. Because of the law of survival of the fittest, people have become more or less adapted to their environment. Those who don't fit in die young. Nutrition of humans is closely tied in with soil conditions. Vitamins and minerals undoubtedly have considerable bearing on how well people feel. But this is beside the point whether one takes on weight or not. The food we eat comes from the soil. Whether we eat the seed and foliage of plants or whether we eat meat, Food from the sea is considerably different, perhaps much better for us than a beefsteak from a steer grown in a feedlot with a corn diet. In other words, even while we admit that there are similarities in the way humans and animals use the food they eat, we must assume that basically our nutrition depends on what minerals are available in the soil and how much sunshine our crops receive when they are growing. Lately, it has come to our attention that the palatability of our food that we grow for our animals depends on the amount and kind of fertilizer we apply to the soil to grow the crop. There is also good evidence that the manner in which the crop is grown and fertilized determines how many pounds of corn silage is necessary to produce a pound of beef. Apparently, the seasonal weather conditions, water, nitrogen, sunshine, and general fertility level determine the nutritional value of the crop. Conditions favoring rapid growth produce proteins and starches as well as other similar products. Protein, a term generally applied to certain compounds, is the result of nitrogen, starches, and sugars being combined through chemical reactions in the plant supported by sunshine. Amino acids are an intermediate stage. The amino acids are water-soluble and are the building blocks of the proteins. In the process of condensation, water is removed, and the final storage protein becomes insoluble in water, but retains certain chemical properties which can affect the growth of the plant. An amino acid is water-soluble and very chemically active, but contains comparatively small amounts of caloric energy. It contains nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a hydrated form. A protein is insoluble in water, usually stored in the plant for future use, and has considerable caloric value as a source of energy for the production of meat. Proteins also contain nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but in a dehydrated condition. The ideal food for animals is, of course, a proper balance between starch, which the plant makes in its leaves as a result of the carbon dioxide absorbed by the leaves and water, 
with the help of the all-important sunshine and proteins. Part of this starch is used in growth and part is the surplus that is stored after the plant has used what it needs to combine with the nitrogen taken in through the roots to form the proteins. If there isn't enough starch made in the leaves, much of the protein exists as soluble amino acids. If there is a surplus of starch, then more of the energy-filled storage proteins is deposited. Seed, potato tubers, bulbs, and other storage organs depend for their size on the amount of surplus starch and storage protein that the plant can accumulate. Corn seed may contain 8 to 14% protein and almost 70% starch and starch-like material. Number two dry corn should not have over 14% water. The actual mineral content accounts for less than 2% of the weight. In other words, when we feed or sell a bushel of corn, which weighs 56 pounds, we are selling approximately 6.7 pounds of protein, of which one pound is actual nitrogen, 41 pounds of starch and other carbohydrates, including some sugar made from the air, and at most one pound of minerals. The water content in this case would be 7.3 pounds. These figures vary according to the season and the amount of nitrogen the plant has access to. We must remember that this corn that is saliable is surplus and is storage material. Our problem is to grow corn in such a way that the plant will produce surplus starch so it can produce large ears with heavy kernels. This gives us corn that will make it possible for the animal to produce the most meat for the least amount of feed. It also stores well in a crib and maintains a constant water supply, which prevents corn from molding in storage. What happens when the plant does not produce enough sugar and starch in the leaves to give the maximum yield? One of the obvious symptoms is the appearance of barren stalks, stalks with no ears on them. Such stalks are large, leafy, often purplish-green in color, because the plant does not have sufficient phosphorus. Too much nitrogen available in the sod causes phosphorus to become deficient. This condition produces a plant with a large part of its protein in the amino acid form. True, it is a high-protein plant, and farmers are told protein is valuable feed, but it's not as valuable as storage protein. The only people who propose the use of more nitrogen are the people who want to sell it. Actually, it is cutting the farmer's yield and raising his costs. There is no rhyme or reason to this philosophy. Many of our experiment station people advocate this program. Either they don't know what they're talking about or they have sold out to the nitrogen interests. We will always have plenty of nitrogen because the raw materials are free and the cost of manufacture is low. Under such conditions, sales pressures will always be exerted, and some of this undoubtedly blows over the heads of some of our research people. During the First World War, we had laughing gas shot at our soldiers to dull their senses so they didn't know what they were doing. It was made from nitrogen. I sometimes wonder whether some of this may not be mixed with our fertilized nitrogen to bewilder some of our research testers. There are other reasons why our crops do not have the best quality. Generally speaking, a soil that has the amount of calcium prescribed by the active clay and organic matter it contains produces the most nutritious food. Actually, the available calcium in the soil pretty much determines the quality of the crop, regardless of the fertilizer treatment. With adequate amounts of lime, we can make few mistakes. But without adequate amounts of calcium, Almost anything we do can be a mistake. The effect of too much nitrogen on a sod well supplied with calcium may not be serious. On a soil with too little calcium, it may be tragic. The amount of rainfall and the amount of cloudy weather can be ruinous. For this reason, the most favorable approach would be to concentrate on supplying sufficient calcium to get the physical and chemical condition of the sod into top form. Having accomplished this, only then are we ready to consider other growth promoters and yield increasers. It is true that one can do certain things to a crop to increase its growth. However, it seems rather foolish to feed a lawn, for instance, with an abundance of nitrogen when the chemical and physical condition of the sod is faulty. This will only make it necessary to mow the grass three times a week instead of once every 10 days, and then the lawn burns up in August. 
That is not good treatment of a lawn. As a matter of fact, it is about as good a method to kill out a lawn as I know of. Very rapid top growth means poor root growth. A plant must make surplus starch in the leaves to make good root growth. If you cut off the leaves, you don't have surplus starch, so you don't have good roots. Consider Canada thistle or quack grass. Both of these plants are hard to kill because they have underground storage roots or stems in which the plant stores protein and starch. We call this storage material root reserves. The principle of killing these plants is to starve the roots. Anything you can do to prevent the plant from storing proteins and starch in these underground stems will gradually kill it. If you have a bad infestation, you can kill it by fertilizing heavily with nitrogen and mowing off the tops every week. Weed killers like 2,4-D will kill thistles by causing the plants to use up these root reserves. We also have materials which will affect quackgrass in a similar manner. Quackgrass won't grow in a lawn because it doesn't have time to store up root reserves since the leaves are cut off so often. It is all based on the physiology of the plant. The more we know about plant physiology, the better equipped we are to know what to do either to promote bigger yields or to reverse our method if we want to kill the crop. Any weed killer that only burns off the leaves is only effective if we make repeated applications. Too often we forget to make the proper application and we condemn the material. The nutrition of our bodies is dependent on the chemical composition of the vegetables and meats we grow on our farms. Thus, to be concerned about human nutrition means we must be concerned about animal nutrition, which in turn means a thorough understanding of soil reactions. In any program of betterment of human beings, we must start from the bottom and work up. If we can handle our soils properly, our animals will thrive better and humans will have fewer miseries. This statement is not without considerable proof. To find such proof, we must scan medical journals, plant science and soil science literature, farm experiences and actual field plot experiments. We have many people working on and doing research in all fields. Most of us are working in cubby holes by ourselves. Often, we feel our field is the only important one to consider. We don't know what someone else is doing. I am only interested in the overall picture. I do not know enough about medicine to comment on it. However, I am of the opinion that if our medical profession had a better understanding of plants and soils, many of our complex problems would respond to simple treatment. I have been interested in the effect of the calcium ion on the growth of plants. I have seen the drastic effects of insufficient calcium. I have seen plants become stunted and actually disintegrate because of lack of calcium. I have seen what I am sure was calcium deficiency causing rotting of human flesh. I assume this was calcium deficiency because the terrible condition disappeared when the plant was daily fed 30 milligrams of calcium gluconate. I realize this is no proof, but when one sees this happening often enough, one begins to feel his observations are more than coincidence. Furthermore, there are medical men who agree with me that there are certain relationships which in the popular vernacular are cures for certain conditions. Since you can't prove anything with research on human beings, you can deduce from cause and effect observations that at least you may be on the right track. As a result of determining the available calcium in thousands of soils in many parts of the United States, I find there is a paucity of calcium. Crop yields have been correlated with these calcium readings. As a result of this, I am convinced that most soils having over one half percent active organic matter must have about 2,800 pounds of available calcium using a weak extracting solution. If we go back and scan the research results from animal feeding, we get the impression that animals with insufficient calcium become irritable, develop sores, have difficulty raising young, not unlike many of the miseries claimed by human beings. In other words, we have more exact proven facts about the health of our plants and animals than the medical profession has about human health, because one can't have checks to compare experimental results in humans. If we can believe a small fraction of what we read about human nutrition, we must draw conclusions from large numbers of people, 100 in one group against 100 treated in another group based on experience from observations 
that consider the variability of the human race. Minerals and vitamins apparently are equally important to man and animals. From observations of their effect on animals, we can assume that in a similar manner they may affect humans. I mention these things because we believe that as a result of our research program, it is possible to grow good crops. Good crops should be good food for our animals, and the meat they produce should be the best food we can get. If we can grow big acre yields by having the minerals in our soils in the right proportions, we are contributing to the production of food that will help us to maintain the high level of good health. It has been my honest opinion that sickness and misery experienced by humans is a reflection of what they eat. Either we don't eat the correct foods, we don't select a wide enough variety, or our foods are grown on such poor soils that they are not giving us the nutrition we need. The method or program presented in the following pages has been geared to grow food as good as I know how to grow. Many people write about human health, diets, vitamins, and minerals. Most of these books are written in popular language by members of our medical profession and are directed to the layman because they encourage a large number of people to read them. As a result, many of them become bestsellers. Whether they do any good is anyone's guess. Some writers criticize them as worthless. Others praise them. Some give a resume of their own experiences after practicing medicine for 25 to 40 years. Their experiences probably are worth more to the reading public than trying to figure out the meaning of many of the experiments in human nutrition. I am listing several of these books and hope you will read them, not because I feel they are authoritative, nor because they have the last word on the subject of human health, but because they are all trying to arrive at the utopia of perfect health. They do all seem to have some bearing on our program of growing crops, since they all cite our poor sods as the cause of much misery. Better crops from our sods mean better feed for our animals and better food for human beings. Folk Medicine was written by Dr. J.C. Jarvis of Vermont. He gives his experience dealing with the health of rural people in Vermont. It represents 40 years of practice. It is simply written. He deals with old homespun remedies found in the kitchen. His standby is a honey and cider vinegar mixture, which some people claim has done them much good. Whether this is real or psychological is immaterial. He believes in well-grown fruit and vegetables but shies away from calcium, a mineral which I deem very important in our diet. 80-Year-Old Doctor's Secrets by Dr. William Brady was written by a practicing physician in Penn Yen, New York. He was also a columnist for many newspapers for 40 years. Experience makes up the background for this book. He emphasizes the need for adequate calcium in the diet, contradicting Dr. Jarvis. Overfed but undernourished, by Dr. H. Curtis Wood, an associate in obstetrics at the Episcopal Stetson and Rolling Hills Hospitals in Philadelphia, is written with more authority and cites many more research results. It also lists many references for further reading. This is a small book and can be read in an evening. I would recommend it for general reading. All of these books are on nutrition. However, Dr. Wood is more specific in his comments. They add bemoan the fact that our soils are becoming depleted of minerals, that our foods don't contain the minerals that we need, and that, therefore, to keep healthy, we must depend on vitamins and minerals along with a few other compounds. We recognize the facts that the proper balance of minerals is very important to grow good crops. The program suggested here is trying to accomplish what these doctors state is the weakness of our whole food-producing machinery. On the basis of experiences people have had, we feel that adherence to this proposed program will help not only build up our sod, but will greatly improve the quality of our food. I have been associated with fertilizer research work in experiment stations for some 25 years. My college research work was in plant nutrition. The program I am now advocating is the result of trying to add some rhyme and reason to the use of commercial fertilizer. My ideas are radically different, only because by changing my ideas, I was able to give farmers help, which they were unable to get before. Many of the ideas I was taught in college were of little help when I came in contact with actual farm problems.
I made many changes, all of which helped me to increase yields and lower costs. After reading various books written by members of the medical profession and reading the criticisms of these books by people who had no connection with the medical profession, I realized that much of our knowledge about growing good food, building our soils to grow better food, and prescribing treatment for ailments is on a very insecure basis. I feel that a continual emphasis on the methods proposed here, backed by research work increasing yields two to threefold with comparatively simple treatment, will go a long way to produce more nutritious food, which in turn will result in better health. The following suggestions are offered for trial purposes and should be considered in detail. A suggested method for growing crops profitably. Step 1. After selecting land which is drainable and workable with available equipment, the profile of the soil should be studied by digging a trench 3 feet deep, 6 feet long, and at least 2 feet wide. Observations should be made for modeling in the A, A, and A horizons or layers root growth, plow soil, hard pan, and signs of good aeration in the different layers. Soil samples should be taken in each horizon. Step 2. Determine the percentage of the base saturation with calcium, because research work done by soil colloid chemists indicates that 85% of the base exchange in the soil to a depth of 3 or more feet must be saturated with the calcium ion before maximum yields can be expected. The base saturation must be determined by a calcium test rather than a soil acidity test. The acidity test does not differentiate between calcium and such other ions as potassium, magnesium, sodium, and ammonium. If the acidity test is used, we never do apply sufficient limestone to reach the necessary 85% calcium saturation. Step 3. Consider tillage methods. While subsoiling or other practices are necessary, consider minimum tillage. Decide on distance between plants. Step 4. Plant crops with fertilizer solutions, not more than 4 gallons of 10, 20, 10 or its equivalent. Step 5. Spray foliage with 10, 20, 10 fertilizer solution.